Trino Community Broadcast 29. Holy mm -hmm. moly, that's really awesome. We are really getting up there in the numbers. And we had a great event last week as well, Trino Community Summit. So there's lots to talk about what happened there. And we're going to go back to the roots a bit and like really recapture what is Trino and talk about all sorts of cool things that are happening in the community. So hold on your horses, get ready. <laughs> Manfred and Brian are going to roll into it with Trino today. So what's up, Brian? Yeah. Uh, how's it going, Manfred? Yeah, it's uh, it's been pretty good. Uh, we, you know, we basically just finished up this Trino Summit last week. Um, we we had um, a lot of really cool talks coming down like it was uh, we had companies like Robin Hood and we had uh, EA. So these were like kind of somewhat newer faces to what we typically have on the uh, on the show or on, on the show on the uh, summits and uh, and also in the meetups. So it was nice to see a couple newer companies. And then we also had familiar faces like Netflix, LinkedIn um, and uh, and a couple of other. I'm, I'm going to miss a couple ones here. Oh, and another really cool one I thought was uh, uh, to note was Apache Iceberg. Um, we typically had this being a Netflix talk, right? But this year it was actually represented by this new company called Tabular. And I thought that was actually kind of neat because, you know, so you have Ryan Blue, who was the creator of Iceberg. He was typically talking like on behalf of Netflix, talking about Iceberg. And we had uh, we had him uh, as the CEO now of Tabular. And I thought that was really neat because we, you know, so Tabular is the kind of uh, enterprise building around these this table format spec slash uh, kind of li set of libraries that build around uh, the spec that more or less replaces the hive for like kind of the um, the data lake type uh, table format. So um, so it was really exciting to see all these different you know newer faces familiar faces and uh, just seeing how people are, are using Trino. I mean, it's it's great, especially when you see the people that have been more established like Netflix, that how they progress and grow uh, over the years and what they're focusing on now. So like they're doing this really fast, nifty cash stuff. Uh, and then, you know, you have like Robinhood that are still in the slightly more earlier adoptive faces as well as DoorDash, that was another one, uh, mm -hmm. who are, are, you know, kind of still making it the uh, a central use case and, and uh, making it uh, much more common, commonly used as the interface for all their all the data platforms. So really, really neat stuff that we saw in the Trino Summit this year. Yeah, no, this was good. Um, it, I was I was amazing when, when when a few days before we hit a thousand registrations, and then yeah, and then actually in the event we had over five hundred people on sometimes. So it's really awesome. Yeah. I love that. And we had a lot of fun too with the Trino quiz and stuff like that. So yeah, we also did event. some fun little trivia. We're sending out people these here. I'll, uh, I still have it here in my office. We have these little swag kits. So we send these out. They have like the Trino bunny shirts and a couple stickers. And uh, we're, we send those out to people who won the trivia as well as our speakers of the show. So if you want to speak at next year's Trino Summit, uh, here, now is a better time than any. Uh, it's it's going to be coming up. Uh, also look for, you know, it's going to be uh, live. Now that's the goal. And last year we did the same thing where we said there's going to be a hybrid event and then we're, we're, we kind of had to go back on that because of Delta variant. So of course, you know, Hang on, hang on by the seat of your pants because we never know exactly <laughs> if uh, we could stick to that. But but the plan is right now uh, to do it closer to summertime and also doing it, uh, you know, a hybrid event this time as well. So uh, so looking really forward to that. And uh, you know, when the, the call for papers come up, we'll we'll be announcing it here so that you can uh, you can get some cool swag kit. You can hopefully meet us all here in uh, you know or here. It'll be at the Commonwealth Club uh, in California in person. So uh, so all really exciting stuff uh, coming down there um what else so yeah today why are we do why are we covering what is trino we we our inaugural uh kind of uh trino community broadcast was on a very similar topic but we called it uh something a little different we said what is presto and uh so that was in i think it, we started the show actually now it's been over a year now we've been we've been doing this so it's i think it was like september of 2020 so that we that. started the show yeah and uh, and so we did a what is Presto show at that time. And at that point in time, we were called Presto SQL. So um, so, yeah, so we'll basically, um, you know, now, obviously, there was a rebranding after that. And we were, I think, seven episodes in. And our eighth episode was actually, you know, with Martin, Dane and David talking about the rebrand. Um, and so we we wanted to do a couple of these one to kind of give a fresh revised look to, you know, some of our older ones. We were still figuring things out. 
and two, we all, we obviously want to make sure that we're saying the right name here. And so, um, and so we 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 figured, you know, why not just go back and do a, redo a couple of these really popular episodes and do it under the right brand, do it uh, with the maybe more updated, uh, you know, feel and a little more confidence. I think that I I feel like I exude now these days that I've <laughs> I've I've had a couple of these episodes under my belt. So um, so yeah, so we'll real quickly be hopping into that. Uh, I want to do a, a, a message from the sponsor Starburst, and then we'll hop right back into some uh, release notes, sneak peeks <laughs> afterwards. Yeah. Cool. I'm Colleen Tarto. I am the director of engineering on Starburst Galaxy. What is it actually offering? So, I mean, I, I think this kind of like builds on some of the open source Trino stuff, but is it doing a lot more? Uh, what what kind of pains is it solving? Could you kind of uh, uh, give us a little bit of insight on, on what actual pain this is going to be uh, uh, alleviating? Yeah, absolutely. And so to, to think about that, I always like to go back and think about what's the difference between Starburst Enterprise and Trino, right? And so I always like to think of Starburst Enterprise as the cool older sibling to Trino. It's a little bit more mature, a little cooler. It's got a, it's got a car. It's got yeah. some cool stuff going on, leather jacket, you know. Um, and Trino is awesome in its own right, don't get me wrong, but Starburst Enterprise is just better and a bit more grown up. And specifically what that means to me is that with Enterprise, you get more. You get more functionality, faster performance, more connectors, more security, better management, better integration into the ecosystem of tools that you already use today, data governance, integration, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but what really speaks volumes to me is that when you use Starburst Enterprise, you get Starburst, right? You get best in class support from the folks who work for us and they know Trino best because they created Trino and they're con continuing to contribute to Trino. Um, but Starburst Galaxy takes that to a whole nother level, right? So one of the pain points is installing, managing, maintaining, monitoring Starburst Enterprise. And so Starburst Galaxy alleviates all that, right? So it's um, a fully managed service. It's Starburst Enterprise as a managed service and more. And one last question. As, yeah. uh going to be any free offerings coming up anytime soon? Is that on the Absolutely. road? Absolutely. We're building out. We've got a free trial. Um, so if you're interested, absolutely reach out to us. We are very excited about it. Um, and then we're talking about sort of a free tier. So like being able to just play around with it in your own environment and see what's what. We'll keep you all uh, up to date on when you can start to play around with Galaxy and Trino uh, for free for just a little bit and uh, get to know this incredible service called Starburst Galaxy. Thank you so much, Helen. Thank you. And by the way, we did get a demo of the latest and greatest Star Wars Galaxy at the summit last week, and it's looking pretty damn good. Yeah, uh, and if you want to actually to follow up on that, if you wanted to, you know, kind of check it out or get your name, I think right now it's we're we're doing a private preview. It's not quite in beta yet, so this is even like this is beta beta. And so if you want to go to starburst.io and go to Galaxy and uh, forward slash Galaxy, you can go down here and actually fill out your name and and fill out all your information and then this will basically be kind of a uh put you onto a list and we'll basically email you out some uh, information to basically po poke around and, and and play around with galaxy um yourself so uh so that's that's pretty exciting uh i don't know what the turnaround or if there's like a if, if we're hitting a cap or something like that so if you do sign up and you don't hear back right away uh well, just, you will hear back it's just you will of, will you be able to be, join the queue and what the timing is got it okay yeah yeah i i you'll hear back but then you you just yeah the question is they'll they'll let you know one way or the other i i suppose i i haven't gone through this way through myself i've been playing around with it uh internally but i'm not sure about the experience here so maybe you know a little more about that manfred <laughs> but, yeah no you you will get you will hear back and then there'll be a bit of an assessment of your use case if it's suitable to what galaxy offers now as features yes or not so that's what Cool. And then, and then you get slotted in line. As, as a yeah. And I'm working on a, I'm working on a blog right now too, to kind of talk about, you know, kind of getting started with both Trino and then also getting started more with like, uh, you know, galaxy and kind of helps like a couple of ways that you can get started with Trino. And I think galaxy is going to be at some point, kind of one of those easy button click ways to get started with Trino so that you don't have to do all the setup, but we're even going to cover a little bit of it today, uh, during a, uh, demo portion. So, but before we do all that, 
talk uh, t tell us about what's coming up in uh release 364 we're not there yet quite quite yet right well the release notes are already in the pr and like this is always the very last step so i'm, I'm guess guesstimating that it's going to be like this weekend or something or maybe even friday or so nice or, or earlier but um it's coming really soon and obviously a star wars enterprise release will fall up but there's some really cool features in there specifically also what i like the most um Alter materialized view is coming. So you yep. can change a materialized view at this stage, only renaming it to a different name. Yeah. But we're also working on changing the SQL statement and also changing the properties that I said. There's a couple of like rigmaroling going around there, how to best do that. Okay. But ultimately materialized views management is gonna is improving more and more. And obviously it's coming in the in the iceberg connector again. So that's cool. Yeah, and, and I think like that the more support we can get around materialized views, like that to me, it, you know, views and materialized views are just I'd say kind of the right way to do so many things in in Trino in general and and trying to basically manage any type of complexity that you're trying to hide, like it's it's just yeah, it super adds the, it it it's like adds that abstraction layer of all these complicated relationships in a table and allows whoever creates the materialized view to distill all the complicated logic, hide it, expose a nice table that brings the info you need. Well, and, and not only that, stuff. like with materialized views too, then you get performance gains. Yeah. If it's like a common okay. set of queries that you're you're hitting nonstop, like you can, when we start to have a lot more support around materialized views, specifically with Iceberg, and people are kind of migrating more into Iceberg, it's like, there's so many performance gains that you can get there. And, and there's people that are doing a lot of funky stuff with cash, but this is like, you know, this is like the easy button version of caching that just like, yeah. okay, you have this query, you hide the logic and you're, you're like, you know, this is a query that's run constantly because our BI tools are, are running this query over and over again. So it's like, that's well, huge. In one, yeah. In one of our prior episodes, I think we were talking some from Netflix, right. And they yeah. were saying like what they have like a couple of thousand view materialized views and views yep. and like that, that's, that's amazing. Right. Like, yeah. That's and then, and then how useful it is. I mean, and then you have Netflix now coming on. They, they, that's, you know, you do that first and then you do, you go on to what they're doing now where they're like caching every single set, you know, portion of the uh, uh, Trino architecture that they can. But, yeah. you know, it's like so many ways that you can speed this up and make it just even like, I mean, I, I, I wouldn't be surprised if they were dealing with sub second latency on their query turnarounds now. Yeah, yeah, no, so. it's, it's, it's very impressive. And and good to see those kind of like super high end use cases. As well. Yeah, for sure. All right, but that's coming. Well, of course, a whole bunch of performance improvements are coming. I just said it like that, because if you look in the release notes, um, it's like things like specific statements, uh, sub statements or the parsing and the planning around these being improved. But, you know, every every sort of grain of salt helps. Yeah, those kind of things. So that's pretty cool. Uh, one thing I put in extra, especially for you, and that is that the Elastic Search Connector no longer fails with unsupported types. So <laughs> yeah. it'll just probably ignore it or just pump out the JSON or like silently go over it. I'm not sure what it does, but I think it pumps out the JSON because now we have that capability with the the feature that I got in a couple uh, releases back. And then I think this is like the so kind of the data. You just like, well, this yeah, is something. you have to process it. And then if it's like, you know, you just have to know, oh, the, uh, you 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 look into what the actual type is and you go, oh, that's not clearly that's not supported. And I, I don't know if there's a way we had a there was a discussion around how we make that obvious to the user. And I'm sure that they're they're probably putting a warning or something like that to saying, hey, we we couldn't uh, parse this because we don't know what the hell it is. Yeah. <laughs> so. And then the other two that I wanted to mention quickly is the Hive connector now has an optimized procedure. And that is really awesome. Like you can basically um, recompact and control the compaction of files and stuff from Trino now. So you can write SQL statements that run this optimized procedure that recompacts and stuff. And that's obviously crazy useful for performance that's huge. reasons, right? Like a lot of systems that ingest data and pump them into your Hive storage will have lots and lots of small files and lots and lots of small files, as anyone knows, that has ever had to read and deal with them are terrible for performance. It's just yeah. terms of like directory reads, IO and all that stuff is really bad. So compaction can make a massive difference. Um, and now you can uh, control that from Trino. You don't need to like futz around with some other tool that deals with that for you. So that's wow. really nice. Yeah. And do you have any like control? Do you know if you have any control like 
on how it compacts or like kind yeah, of yeah yeah it's you, you can like set up where statement and stuff like that so wow that's awesome you and can it, really find greatly controlled what you're compacting right like you don't have to go compact everything because then obviously that would like be crazy in terms of performance if it suddenly has to yeah. compact across everything you can literally say like if you have something like that's time based for example you say yeah. just compact like the last week or whatever right? yeah or compact like you're you're doing it like a daily or something like that or even yeah, like an hourly like you you just say hey compact this hour we just finished you know inputting into this hour now compact it yeah exactly and do yeah. some sort so of airflow it's, it's, job it's really on good it. and then you could roll it even to like uh, you know the older stuff compact it to daily weekly monthly whatever nice. so it'll be really useful too and it allows it's, you to set file size and stuff. So pretty cool. I'm wondering if that's going to port over at some point into Iceberg because we have those same same problems in Iceberg, I'm right? I'm sure. Like the syntax for it is like um, uh, execute a procedure. Yeah. And it's it's a table procedure. So I'm pretty sure that will be able to be pumped over to Iceberg as well. The calls, nice. like the general SQL syntax is, is portable. Yeah. So it's just cool. a question of other connectors taking that up and implementing it under the hood, whatever needs to happen. So. Nice. And then Parquet and Avro had fixes and improvements again. So the two file formats that are combo. Um, Parquet, uh, probably the most common used file format on the Hive connector, Avro, another one. Orc is the third one, but that's that has a long standing high quality already. So Parquet and Avro got a whole bunch more fixes and improvements. So. Nice. So those are the main things that I, I could see. There's obviously more, but well, in a few days you can see it yourself. And if you if you're sneaky, you can look into the release notes pull <laughs> request as well. But very sneaky. <laughs> we have a lot of sneaky people on this show or that, that in the audience. Um, should we go on and talk about uh, a little bit about our favorite query engine? Yeah, let's do it. To the concept of the week. So, so you said our favorite query engine. What is a query engine even? <laughs> good, good point. So, um, I mean, when we talk about a query engine, right, we're, we're talking about uh, a subset of like, or maybe, a you know, one part of a database. Um, a query engine is, is focused on, on actually doing the steps uh, to, let's say, plan a query. So, you know, you'll, or I can, actually, let's even back up a little further. Um, you know, we, we're taking the steps to first take in some sort of input from uh, a user. It doesn't have to even be SQL. It could be some sort of query language of any sort, right? Um, but but in our case, uh, for Trino, we're talking, you know, SQL, which is the standard around a, a particular query language that, you know, uh, that we, we, we follow very closely to, you know, a particular one called ANSI. And then uh, we take in this input and we parse it, we, we, by parsing it, I mean, we kind of try to split apart what are all the different things that people are, you know, these different words that people are sending to us. So these SQL words, what, you know, what, what are they? What, are they in the correct form? And then we, we move on to this kind of uh, analyzing phase where we actually say, okay, is everything correct? Like, did they actually adhere to SQL or did they just give us gibberish? Um, or did they just maybe get one word wrong or and spell something incorrectly? And then, you know, at that point we say, Hey, wait a second. This is not in our lexicon. You know, we don't we don't know this word. This is out of our language. You know, or you're speaking Spanish, we speak English, and so <laughs> we 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 go whoa 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 whoa. It's like uh, when you're you know on the street and you're uh, in a country that you don't know the language. If somebody starts coming up to you and talking to you in that language, you go oh English English English. <laughs> you know, that's basically what Trino does whenever you try to throw a SQL uh, or sorry something that's not SQL at it and or a you know a broken version of SQL. It says wait a second. I don't understand that and uh, so then you you pass that let's say you do are you are speaking the same language we pass it on to the analyzer and then it's saying okay now is what you're saying actually making sense so you know is is the words that are, are you you know saying like it to art thou what from are you know like those are words those are english words but then like how do i actually make sense of what those mean so that's when we go into the analyzer and we actually try to say oh okay this table that you're referencing does have a column here and it does that that you've referenced in the select part of the statement and uh we also uh have a where clause that filters on this and it is in fact a number that where we can do a greater in than 30 or something like that so that that's where we do the analysis and then from that point we move on to actually saying okay it's it's it, it's making sense what you're trying to do here now how are we actually going to execute this on 
this, you know, this thing. And, and one thing we didn't mention before, we said that, uh, you know, this is a query engine, but it's also a distributed query engine. And what that means is there's a lot of nodes that are going to take advantage of the, uh, or basically we're going to take advantage of all these different nodes and run a lot of this stuff in parallel. Um, so there's not one server, there's many, many servers that yeah. run in collaboration with Yeah, in, in and contrast to a MySQL. Data sources, right? Yeah, in contrast to like, let's say, you know, how, how would you say like a MySQL would run? That would, you know, is that usually like a, a single yeah, server type? Yeah, typically of? one server, right? Yep. So, and you're scaling that up to like, you know, we, we call that vertical scaling. We're going to throw more RAM at that one server. We're going to throw more, you know, storage space at that one server, more net network IO at that one server. But here we're saying, we have a lot of nodes and we want to split all the work across those nodes. And so that's what we mean when we say distributed. Um, so, so we have this distributed piece and we need to basically say, okay, what you're trying to do makes sense, but how are we actually going to split up the work? How are we actually going to, uh, you know, make, make all this stuff happen across, uh, all these different nodes so that you get an answer back that, you know, the answer is the question you're asking. Right. So this is where we start getting into the planning. And not only do we want to plan, we, we want to say, hey, this is going to get you the correct results. But we also want to say, well, we know that you wrote it this way, but we actually want to try to make things run for you a little faster. Maybe we could put in a little bit of smarts into this query engine and optimize and basically set up this other piece called the optimizer, where it, it starts making these intelligent decisions of saying, hey, if I, I could just scan all the data here, but instead, I know that you're only going to need this small chunk, so I'm only going to scan that small chunk. And so you finally get to that one of those uh, more final phases of the optimizer, and you get and you actually uh, uh, get the, get it to where you you know split it up into these stages. And we'll we'll have visuals here in a second to talk about all this. And then you know finally you need to schedule it, right? So you right. schedule it out, and you actually. Uh, tell the, all the individual workers, and you know, in a traditional database, this would just be the one worker, the one node. But in our case, we're we're telling multiple workers how to coordinate, how to scan from all these different locations, maybe from different databases. In our case, we could talk to MySQL and Postgres uh, underneath the covers. We could also talk to a data lake, like you know, using the Hive setup, and we can also talk to or Iceberg, and then we could also talk to like NoSQL databases or Phoenix or all these other big data, uh, you know. Uh, 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 types of systems that we have out there, right? So, you know, we we coordinate all of these different actions that are going to be done by these workers. And at the end of all of that, you know, work that's being done, they're going to return something to, you know, maybe one server, and that's going to go back up to the coordinator. And that will then get returned to you as the uh, as the person who asked the question, right? And that all of that, you know, that's a that's kind of within the scope of a query engine. But if you think about well, how's that different from what a database that did a lot of things, right? That's all things that a database does. The big, I mean, really, the big difference when it comes into is that Trino doesn't have any storage. Trino uh, does does not actually have any native storage, I should say. So where is the stuff stored then? Well, how about you know? I'm going to switch this over, Manfred. I'm going to ask you that question. Where do we store things, the actual data, and where does it come from? If we're just a a, a brain without you know guts, you know. Well, that's that that's the that's the smart part about it, um, and that's one of the key factors that enables Trina to be so useful. And that is because it doesn't have any storage, uh, and it as an architecture, it has a plugin architecture that uh, implements what's called connectors. Those connectors can be you can have multiple and so what can happen is you can use that same query engine connecting to different databases so yeah. like you said before this can be a mysql database it can be a postgres database it can be also a non uh, like a system that doesn't even understand sql so like Elasticsearch or mongo all yeah. of those systems have connectors you can write that standard ansi sql um ANSI just stands for American National Standards Institute. By the way, it's like an international standard. It's the ANSI and the ISO SQL is the same thing. It's just a standardized SQL dialect, the most common one. And that's what we aim towards. Yep. And you can write those queries. And the query will work no matter if the data is in Elasticsearch or in, uh, in Postgres. Or, and that's the very common and initial use case in a system that's called like Hive. Yep. It's basically files stored in an object storage system, a distributed object storage across many servers 
Nowadays, most of these are sitting in the cloud and common yeah. names, you know, these things are like Amazon S3 or Google Cloud Storage or yeah. Azure Blob Storage. So those yeah. are the typical systems where you have some sort of system that dumps files into that and you now can read them. And Trino is a query engine that doesn't want to worry about all the storage aspects. Yeah. But it takes advantage of understanding all these different ones. And then in one place, you can query them. And that's really amazing because yeah. you can also write queries that say, well, I know the financial info is in the Oracle database, but the transaction log from the purchase is in a web database. That's an object storage somewhere. And you can, with Trino, write a query that puts all of that together in one. That's super yeah. cool. And, and what's really powerful about this, like the traditional way that you would do this before a query engine like Trino that can just ad hoc do all of this, you know, kind of moving around and, and, and merging on the fly. And when, when I mean by on the fly, it's like, Previously, you would have something like a, uh, you know, a, a data warehouse, and this was a very yeah. common paradigm to to run analytics. Um, and so, you would what you needed to do is, I instead of having a database where you're trying to, you know, maintain some sort of state, you have these other kind of goals where you're trying to just get a, a widespread picture of what's going on in the business versus, you know, just maintaining some particular state in, let's say, your marketing or your sales uh, type of database. And uh, what you want to do is you're, you're ultimately trying to get all that data into one spot so that you can ask that one, you know, kind of warehouse is what they're, they're calling it. Yeah. You know, you, that one warehouse is like basically a, yet another, it's just another database, but it has special, it's, it's set up specially so that you can do, you know, this, this kind of massive uh, types of uh, queries. And it does a lot of, um, you know, caching and optimization uh, internally to it so that you, you know, you can get the answers back still pretty quick. But what, what was problematic about it is you actually had to move or copy all the data from across your org and all these different stateful uh, databases. You copy that data from those databases into this one warehouse and that takes forever. It gets out of sync really fast. It's super complicated as a process to establish. There were huge, massive teams, you know, like in the past, I worked on organizations that had these OLAP cubes and stuff for that, yep. like massively big servers with lots and lots of additional storage, very complex, what's called ETL processes, so yep. extracts, transfer and load, which basically says you have to figure out what the source data is look like, how do you have to massage it and change it around so that the data types line up with the, the target system, and then you have to do various compactions and stuff like that. So what typically happened is the data was available in the source system where you track, like in your web system, and the data the user pressed the order like but in the in the data mod it took two three days or whatever yeah until the data made it over or maybe even longer right and that obviously causes huge delays with trino you can query it right when it arrives yep and, and you don't have to you don't have to move all of the data right you're no. only talking you're only basically so essentially what trino tries to do and this is one of the bigger confusion points about trino is like i'm trying to get this information from this database and this database and what I'm, what Trino is basically trying to do is it wants to offload as much work onto those, you know, databases because they have special indexes. They have all of this, you know, internal and in, like uh, speed ups that they do really well. Say a MySQL database that has a B tree index that where they do that, yeah, where they do that, right? And so what Trino is trying to do is first, it's going to try to push down those queries and and offload all of the queries that can just happen natively on the on the data source. Uh, as quick as as best as possible, right? So so it's going to push what we call query push down, push it down to that. It's going the MySQL engine will then run the uh, the faster you know kind of like subset yeah, of the query it indexes and all that kind of jazz, right? And then it's only going to return it's only going to return the subset that's that it's meaningful to the answer of of the query that was asked to Trino originally. And so you get only that subset of data that comes out of there. You're not scanning an entire you know, table worth of data and, and just streaming it back to Trino and then Trino does all the all the cutting and yeah. processing, right? It it's it's doing this in a very smart way so that you're you're moving as little data as possible. And this is in contrast to ETL where it's basically saying up front, hey, we got to move everything before we can even start asking questions. And yeah. that's that's where things are really stale. Well what if I want to ask a new question well, okay, you got to coordinate with the data team here, and then over in the, in the next couple months, we'll we'll get a new data mart set up so that you can actually ask that question appropriately. And that that's not efficient, right? It's, it's yeah. just nicer if you could basically just let them 
figure out the you know the data marts themselves and and kind of self service themselves the the to, to set up their own data mart. It doesn't even have to be a mart anymore. It's basically just a I, I go it's out just there. The data I, wherever it sits, right? Exactly. You just you query the data where it sits. So so this is the the big contrast, you know, compared to the kind of original older ways of doing um, this this you know kind of uh, analytics uh, workflow versus you know nowadays we're we're dealing with query engines that can just talk to all of these things. And so. Um, so this was a great, nice little, like, I think, why do we love Trino so much and why is it so cool? Um, is the, and, and why is it a, just a query engine and where do we store that data? Well, th we don't store the data and that's kind of one of the cool, cool things about Trino. Now, what I'd like to get into um, a little bit is about talking about some of the history. And so last week, uh, Martine, one of the co-creators of both Presto and Trino, and I say Presto, because this is uh, getting into the history element. Um, they, uh, they basically gave a state of the project. They talked about kind of what's happened in the last year, as well as uh, kind of moving forward, what's, uh, you know, what's what we're going to be expecting in the next year. So I wanted to briefly go over the history and also maybe even snip through a couple of these, uh, you know, kind of exciting, more exciting slides. Now, we're not going to cover this in, in its entirety. There'll be a recording up uh, here shortly. Uh, that that has the whole Martine talking about this, but I did want to get into some of the the kind of historical bits of the project. So uh, I like this slide that Martine also has. It's kind of if you know Presto or if you've been using you know Presto SQL. So this is where it gets into the the weeds a little bit. Uh, we're basically the same software, the same people as you know uh, like kind of the original Presto, but we have a shiny new name and a, and a very cute bunny mascot. Sitting right there, right, mm -hmm. and well, here, up oh, here on my shoulder. <laughs> here, on, yeah, there you go. There on your shoulder. Here on my, <laughs> on my little stool back here. Uh, and so, what we're, uh, what we're basically going to talk about is, you know, in the original time, like you know, timeline. You look back at, and, and then let me see if he has the actual. Uh, do we have? No, we don't have. Well, it. just for, for for completeness, the project is going to be celebrating 10 years next year. Yeah, 10 years next year. So started out in 2012, right? This was uh, this was Presto DB uh, under the the uh, name or the banner of Presto DB. This was uh, Martin, Dane, and David. Uh, so I'll say their full name. So you get if you want to look them up, Martin Traverso, uh, Dane Sundstrom, and David Phillips, as well as actually a fourth member, Eric Huang, um, who who had a little exit and then he came back. He's actually working at Starburst now. Um, so uh, they all created uh, Presto, what was originally called Presto, back at Facebook, and this was back in 2012. So over time, uh, they, you know, they had a lot of great success. They were doing all the things that we were telling you that they were doing with like creating this system that has the ability to federate queries, has the ability to pr practically replace these old, you know, data lakes that were a little slow and clunky on uh, the system called Hive. And uh, now we, you know, we now have this capability to, you know, cert like query our data lake super fast. And not only that, now we can join it with other, other data sources. And so they were creating this and this project, you know, from the get go, uh, all the three uh, founders, uh, Martin, Dan and David, they really wanted to focus on making this open source, making this something that isn't just going to get siloed off into Facebook and only be used by Facebook for a couple of years and then maybe die away or, or get repurposed in some way, uh, you know, just specific to what Facebook needed, right? So they they really early on before the project had any success or name or claim to fame, uh, you know, they they wanted to make sure that this was open source and that you know everybody could contribute their own use cases. That the project grew to some organic growth to uh, around uh, needs of different companies. Uh, so early on, they recruited their friends from Airbnb, from uh, Uber, from a couple different big big companies in the valley. And got them on board really, really early. And uh, we started, slow, you know, over the first three or four years, you started hearing these other companies, you know, kind of Netflix and LinkedIn started to kind of, you know, raise their hand and say, hey, we're also using Presto. And this, it just grew into something really huge by about, you know, especially by 2015, this was becoming, you know, much more of a de facto standard to kind of contend with the, the Hive architect or the Hive, um, you know, kind of uh, data warehouses at the time. So as it grew and grew and grew, um, you know, 2018 comes around, uh, popularity of the project's really high. Facebook wanted to have a little bit of tighter control. 
We're not going to go into too much about the, the specifics here, but there is a blog here. If you want to learn more, if you go to Trino, it's uh, it's called when we are announcing Trino, it goes into more of the specifics. But basically, Facebook wanted tighter control. Martin, Dan, and David uh, and the community at large really pushed back on this. And uh, But there was nothing they could do because, again, this was kind of uh, more or less managed by Facebook. And so uh, the decision was made. Martin, Dan, and David quit Facebook uh, shortly after. And then they move on over into um, uh, into uh, basically creating their own uh, branch called Presto SQL. And that's why you see this Presto SQL versus what we've said before, Presto DB. And so what the, the, the idea was at that time was that Presto SQL or Presto DB was going to become a more Facebook centric project and that Presto SQL was going to basically, uh, you know, become the open source version. And yeah, so and that's what basically happened, right? Like, I mean, yes. That is what happened. You should be sure uh, later on the growth and stuff, like the community grew tremendously, yeah. right? So there's yeah. a lot happening in the Trina project now. Yeah, so since that that split happened in early in January 2019. Again, the uh, the the Facebook decision came around late 2018, and then Jan 2019 is when they split off. And then this is essentially you know the Trino, the number of commits that went on to Trino, a lot of things that were getting stalled in the PrestoDB project finally were able to get merged in. You know, this includes like dynamic partition pruning, uh, all of these other really cool things that a lot of folks from connectors, yep. a lot of improvements on all the connectors. Yep. Uh, performance per improvements on on hive all sorts of cool stuff and so you can just see all the graph here you know and, and it continues on to the you know to this day is just uh, the gap is just getting wider and wider this is presto db uh you know work is more or less flatlining and uh and so what it really comes down to is the community you know followed over moved into uh presto sql and after two years of this kind of confusing state of having two projects called presto um the PrestoDB Foundation uh, got donated to Linux Foundation. Linux Foundation has, you know, more or less policies that they need. They they impose trademarks on anything that they own. So that trademark was imposed, and uh, and we had to basically change the name to Trino. So you can find out more and about uh, information about that on the blog as well as uh, episode eight. We actually interviewed Martin, Dana, David right when we were doing this change over to Trino. So I think like. You know the the important thing to take away from all this is that the two projects, you know, one one piece to think about is that they share six years of history. So in a lot of ways, they're very similar. But forty percent, and this is a, a number that came from Martin at this uh, this state of Trino talk. Now forty percent of the code that's in Trino is now all things that have been uh, that have already changed that have been uh, added and contributed since the split um, in uh, in two thousand nineteen. So a good chunk of the, you know, they're, they're similar in terms of the, I guess, a lot of the use cases. But when you look at the performance and when you look at a lot of the features that are coming out around both these projects, uh, it's, you know, there is much fewer. There are some new things as well in PrestoDB to be like they're doing stuff with Spark and things like that. But and uh, it's a lot more Facebook centric use cases and not as much, you know, really helpful to kind of the average company. So. We have, so that is really when it comes down to like, you know, helping you understand where the history came from, where like why we talk about Presto sometimes and then other times we're saying Trino almost interchangeably. Hopefully this kind of shines a little bit of light on on exactly kind of what we're, we're talking about there. So let's do a quick, uh, you know, here's a couple of cool stats. Uh, you know, we have 520 contributors. Um, you know, we we are now actually at 5,300 Slack members and about 500 active. Uh, so it's a very thriving community there. Um, we get in about you know uh, a release, approximately a release a month, and we're we're trying to up that this year. Um, and then you know uh, 400 monthly commits. Uh, 2000, as you saw in the previous slide, it was we're, we're encroaching on 25,000 commits now, and uh, definitely a 47% increase since the split compared to the Presto DB split. So it's really exciting to see. And, and this is, you know, what happened uh, with our, if you look at GitHub stars at all, uh, you know, as soon as we rebranded and people realized we were not Presto DB, you know, we quickly, you know, like a yeah, come on the band but it's at fault a bit there too, actually. Like it's yeah. definitely helping to have a great- That guy. <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah, totally. So, um, you know, we also have a nice set of uh, who's using it. And if you are using Trino, please do, you know, reach out to myself or Manfred uh, or anybody really in the uh, Trino Slack channel. And we can get your, your company's name up here as well as if you can give us a quick testimonial on how you use Trino. Um, so we, he goes into a lot of these recent innovations. Um, one of the particular exciting ones is that, you know, granular fault tolerance, you know, so, uh, in, in kind of tandem with a lot of people try to do, uh, we're, we're trying to sway back towards this original use case of batch, you know, uh, Trino has by, by and large been primarily used for the Federation and, uh, and fast data, data query use case. Analytics, but, mostly, yeah. And, 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 and ad hoc kind of human in the loop type queries. But when it comes to the batch ETL, it kind of fell a little like on the lower priority list, but that is now coming into the back up to the higher priority list. People are always asking, hey, how can we do batch and ETL type stuff with, with Trino? Because we, we, we don't want to have more tools and we want to basically get as much done with Trino. So this is you know one of the really exciting things I thought uh, Martin announced uh, at uh, Trino Summit, as well as uh, you know some of these things like dynamic functions. We're always getting people asking, hey, how do I add UDS? In fact, I think that we covered that as a question of the week just yeah, recently. Yeah, you can, but it's not easy, right? <laughs> yep. So we're, we're looking at these SQL defined functions uh, in other languages like, like JavaScript so that you can just, you know, it, it has a more dynamic loading uh, uh, capability. Um, and so we're definitely looking into that. Match recognized a couple of things that came up this time, but, uh, and uh, and we're, we'll get into a lot more of these things that, you know, if you're starting out and just learning about a lot of this, we're gonna actually be covering a couple of the images that come from this Trino definitive guide that was written by who who is who's that author there? I see in the second spot. Is that Manfred Moser? Um, I have to show you this author has a Chinese version now in hand as well. Ooh, and, wow! And I, I found out how to sort of theoretically write my name in Chinese. I have no idea what it's like. I could not <laughs> replicate this feature, but wow. nice, nice, yeah. So but yeah, me, and Matt, and Martin got that together in the course finish line. And now I have like really weird light happening here. Yeah. Uh, so, so I think, uh, you know, one of the, one of the main things uh, that, you know, we wanted to bring is, is a couple of resources for people that are new. And uh, again, maybe we've already talked a lot about, you know, what a query engine is and stuff, but I think it also helps to kind of help do this visually. So this will be in the show notes if you're, if you're listening to this, but um, we'll, we'll, we'll briefly cover and kind of revisit what we had discussed before. And all of these images, by the way, do come from that book. So, um, you know, if you wanted to learn, by the way, more about uh, State of Trino, that recording will be coming out and you'll be able to hear Martin talk about all the upcoming stuff. And then right now, uh, Manfred, why don't you kind of talk to a little bit to some of these images since you are one of the authors on this book and just you yeah, know, kind so of. That's a, that sounds good. Yeah. So the, this first image here is literally just a Trino architecture as a, as a like high level overview. And um, it sort of starts at the top left where you see the client image. The client is basically anyone that sends a query to Trino. And that is typically done either in the Trio CLI, so you type a SQL command or you use something like dBeaver or Tableau or Looker or a hundred other different tools uh, down to dbt or whatever. There's many, many tools. They send a SQL SQL statement to the coordinator. So in a, in a Trino cluster, you have multiple machines. One of them is called the coordinator. That's the main machine that exposed that is exposed to the outside world for you as clients to connect to. And that's the one that does the, the orchestration of everything. And then there's many, many workers that do the sort of heavy lifting. Yeah. And that's kind of um, what we had discussed before in, in, in words. And now I think this is a good picture to kind of you know, bring all that together, the parse analyzer, the planner, the scheduler, like that's all done in the coordinator. And I, I remember right, yeah. when I first read that, I was like, wow, the coordinator does like a lot of stuff. But then when you think about how long those parser analyzer, planner, scheduler parts take. Um, they are super fast, right? Like they're very yeah. small, like the, the parsing and all that is like sub seconds or like super small. And then the heavy lifting is done by the workers because yep. what you have to keep in mind is ultimately all those workers have to connect to the underlying data sources yep. by the cattle connectors and they then do the reading of the data and typically you know it's always io that's long right like yep. you have to write via http or whatever protocol from that underlying data source you take all that data in and then you process it you map it and you like do the joins and whatever else aggregations all the functions what happens all that happens with 
all the workers doing their work together and they also talk to each other and ultimately they then bring the results set back to the coordinator and the coordinator gives it to you as a client as a result yeah yeah and, and i think that that's super especially like the there's there were older versions too that had this uh, a little bit off could you talk a little bit about what some of the older architectures yes yeah, so some, some some misconceptions are about the workers talking back to the clients that's not happening yeah the workers talk to the different data sources and each worker in itself is also has multi like it's a big like those all those machines are big machines right they have many many threads running on a massive uh, java virtual machine and yep. those all run in parallel so there's many workers in parallel working and each worker has many threads on it all working in parallel so it's really yep. a massively parallel system that really hits the underlying data sources pretty hard right like sometimes um underlying data sources get a lot of chatter from that because the Trino just really hammers it and and takes as much information as it can as fast as it possible can and then merges and gets it back to use so it's really really high high performance and that's a cool term that you brought in there too manfred and i actually hate introducing that term first and and explaining it after i'm glad that we didn't even bring that in but one of the other terms mpp that it stands for massively parallel processing systems right and yeah, so exactly. so that that what, what manfred just described there where you're you're doing you know internode uh type of parallelism and we'll show this in a couple of the diagrams below but like internode as well as intranode uh level parallelism where you're running on on various threads then you know that is actually why we call that's a mpp architecture right you're you're just doing as many ways that you can slice the data up and run uh, and process it basically in parallel uh, and taking advantage of that at, at, at every possible point, that is MPP architecture. And so the full terms, now that we've actually brought that up is, uh, Trino is a MPP distributed SQL query engine. So that's all all the words that, that come together. That's how you describe Trino. And I'm glad that we finally did hit on oh, that. We really need to know a lot. <laughs> To, to, to actually that, yeah. even understand what that, that, that description is, right? And unless you do right. have that background, it's not clear. Cool. So what? So how does like Trino then actually make this like this uh, ability to query across all these different things? Like you know, do you well, basically Trino, just Trino have to has write its a whole own understanding of SQL and the data types, right? Like it basically follows as closely as possible to ANSI slash ISO SQL. Yeah. So it understands the ANSI keywords and the, the the special data types, and then it has what's called an SBI. Uh, SBI is a service provider in, interface. Uh, that's what it stands for. And we had a question about that in the quiz <laughs> yeah. on the Twitter summit. Um, if, if, if SBI sounds confusing, just think of it as a reverse API. It's basically something that the connectors have to implement in order mm -hmm. to understand how to talk to Trino. Like a connector, like the Hive connector or the MySQL connector has to understand that when I talk to Trino, the data type x means the data type y in mysql right like timestamp with time zone precision six yeah. might be something else in mysql and it's something different in kafka or different yeah. again in cassandra right so each of those connectors has to implement this sbi yeah so that trino can generically ask to a connector and say hey does this table exist does this column exist what's the data type for it and yeah. the connectors will do all those translations and trino can then not care about the underlying details it just does its planning based as like everything is all the same to it but in fact that connectors then when they talk to the data source translated appropriately and that's what the sbi does and there's these different uh like subsections of the of the sbi metadata data statistics data location and the streaming of the data itself yep cool uh and so when we we talked a little bit about this before but you know the kind of First thing you'll do is you'll have this, you know, on the left here, a select, you know, and this is like select dot, dot, dot. So there's this big query, you know, that yeah. comes in, select something from this and, or with this from that, um, you know, and that gets into the parser analyzer. That's again, the, the part where Trino is trying to say, Hey, uh, I don't understand the language you're speaking in, or you, or if you said a, a, a one word that was off, you know, like, Hey, I really like fumble grubbings. Wait, what is fumble grubbings? Like, yeah. I, <laughs> you know, so it, it'll it'll complain and say and, and say, no, 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 I don't understand what you're saying here at this parser analyzer level. And okay, maybe the words you said were right, but I like uh, you know, 
uh, uh, I don't know, fork in a fork in my eye or something like that. Wait, wait, are you sure you like a fork in your eye? Are you sure that you're, <laughs> no, no, I, I actually, sorry, contact solution in my eye, you know? <laughs> and so that's where the analyzer comes in and tries to make sure that you actually mean what you're saying. And then, uh, you know, then you go into the second phase of planning and optimizing before you come out with this, uh, you know, on the other side, they, they show this kind of graph figure. Yeah, so what's, what's that graph figure? Plan and optimizer is the plan and optimizer um, has to like, once you know that what you need to do, right? Like, you know, that you, there's these five different tables that you have to access and you have to do these joints with these and these fields. Um, the logic then, uh, like theoretically, if you go brute force, you're like, well, I'm going to load all the data from all these tables and give them to Trino. Obviously that's a dumb idea because then you have to load lots and lots of data and you have to do lots of processing. So there's a lot of smarts possible to break up do I only load a certain segment of the table? And yeah. uh, actually maybe I load that other table first and not that one. And like I apply the condition first and then I load it or I push yep. that condition down. So there's a lot of planning and that sort of stuff happening first on a, on a logical level. And then it also has to uh, adapt it to the cluster, right? Like it makes a difference if you have a cluster that has two workers or if it has 10 workers or 100 workers, right? Like you can break the different segments of data to load up more, right? Like if you need to load, uh, like there might be a query that ultimately you need to load a million records. There's just no way you need to load those million records. Yep. What makes a big difference if you load a million records on one machine or if you load it on a thousand machines because, well, each machine can then in parallel load that data much faster, obviously, right? Like there's huge gains to be had. So that's where the having this massive parallel optimizing happening uh, makes a big difference, right? Because, well, it just gets broken up into all these smaller tasks that are done in parallel, right? And so you get that distributed query plan then. And that's, right. that's then uh, sent to the workers and then they, they run with it. Just realized we had a couple uh, questions come in. Uh, I got a question coming in saying, greetings, database magicians. I love that title. Uh, can Trino fetch and possibly modify data from multiple different data sources like a JSON file, SSDB, MongoDB, and one select with joins request? Yes, it can. That's yeah. the thing, right? Like, that's, exactly <laughs> that's exactly the, what it the does. Right? Like, <laughs> like it can access all these different data sources. And yes, for example, if you have an Elasticsearch connector, the underlying storage is probably JSON files or something like that. And in fact, the feature we were just talking about was, well, what happens if that data type is not understood by Trina? It just returns the uh, JSON in that subsection. But you can have queries that access all these different systems and even like update queries and that kind of stuff now in many connectors. Awesome. Thanks for that question. Yeah, it's a great question, actually. I mean, that's that's uh, I think what we're answering today, and, and it's very important to fundamentally understanding what Trino does. Um, also, uh, Rose came in saying, sweet frog. I think that was talking about the cover of the uh, <laughs> the book. Yeah, <laughs> so, I think it's called a leopard frog or something. It says on the book what it is. It's oh, nice. in the US, somewhere on the East Coast, supposedly. So oh, one of those nice. people that live over in Boston and surf for the South <laughs> should know that frog. Oh, very fair one. And then Damon, uh, as usual, thanks for tuning in like all the time, being one of our most faithful subscribers and uh, slash uh, joiners of these shows. So uh, always love seeing you around, man, and uh, all the support you give us on Trino. Um, okay, so moving on, then we so you know you basically come out with this distributed plan, and that's kind of essentially saying, okay, we know how many workers we have, we know how many you know kind of stages we need to run this in. So let's go ahead and do that and. Uh, at that point, the scheduler starts kind of divvying up uh, at a, you know a stage level. I think as you're creating these stages, you're also creating these, this concept of a task. And yeah. a task is what actually gets sent to a worker to actually get executed, right? Yeah, exactly. So you, so this is kind of a nice little pictorial representation of, hey, we have three tasks, we have three workers. I mean, ideal world, this is not going to, you know, the reality is definitely not going to look as beautiful as this, but, you oh, know. It's all dynamic and on the fly and super fast, right? So it yep. goes like crazy everywhere. But. And it's trying to make smart decisions like, hey, there's, you know, worker one is still, you know, chugging along on a lot of these, you know, other tasks. Let's start giving worker two and three a little bit more tasks if it's, you know, to, to, to try to basically do a little bit of load balancing uh, yeah, in that sense. Yeah, involved and all that kind of stuff. And those, as you can see here also, the, the different data segments are like broken up in splits, what's called a split. Yep. And then they can be passed along between workers uh, and for the aggregation of things and stuff like that. Ultimately, yep. 
uh, where the different workers then basically collaborate and produce the result that then ultimately ends up at the, yeah. at the coordinator and comes back to you. I, I always like to think of tasks as like these item potent functions that just take in something and spit it out. You know, it's like a very functional that's programming time. Yeah. And, and that's what you need for parallel processing, right? You want item potent functions and item potent means like that every single time that whatever I get in, if I get in the same, you know, input, I'm going to always have the same output. It's not going to change based on some state in some other machine somewhere. It's always, and so like, like, you know, we're not we're not a, a stateful task, right? These tasks will always uh, put out push out the same thing if it's given the same input. And then we basically just take these little splits, or these you know, as streams of data that are just getting you know uh, uh, feed fed into these little item potent functions, and then it's just kind of going along this web or this you know kind of uh, graph of you know things until it reaches the end. Is how I always like to picture that uh, that uh, thing going across. And so this last little one is kind of showing that last level of parallelism. So before we were always talking about internode parallelism. Now, let, you know, tell us a little bit about what these, you know, intranode parallelism uh, does for us at, in the task level. Well, as you as you mentioned, right, like a worker is a is a big big server that has a, a Java virtual machine uh, that runs lots of threads in parallel, and they, it can receive not just one task. It gets lots of tasks and internally each task is assigned a driver and uh, through multiple steps it basically receives a split like receives a bunch of data in a split does its processing and then as an output creates the split yeah of whatever the output is right like say for example the input is a couple of records and then it needs to find like the highest one or like because there's a max sorting happening or something like that so it just like filters out all the ones that are not 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 the highest like it gets the top three or whatever and then the output on that split is just the last three nice and then that happen, and then they get processed again and run in parallel on the same worker or even on other workers and ultimately end up back at the user yep yeah and and i mean again same same similar concept that you know you would think about a task but except for it's applied onto the thread right it's these little functions that basically just take some input, spit some output, and then, you know, it's it could get a lot more, you know, complex than that. But, you know, it's it's in a simplistic view, I like how that that kind of is I mean, what I picture in my mind. And I also picture ACDC rock metal when I <laughs> think about all of the data passing by. I just picture like guitar solos. Yeah, yeah. Some... <laughs> the band band playing them as well, right? Like, That's like, as well. <laughs> yeah. If anybody's curious as to why I chose classic rock for that, it's just exactly how I picked uh, this mental image that I have of data flying by and guitar solos going. So, <laughs> <laughs> anyways, that's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> um, so uh, with that, uh, you know, I think that's you know, I, I think that's a pretty good summary for those that are kind of you know not sure what or learning about what Trino is and kind of a uh, you know bird's eye view. Of course, you know check out the Trino definitive guide, which we have linked in all these because the, all of these images are sourced from that book. There's a free copy and that you Starburst can get gives. you for free, right? Like that's <laughs> yeah. the important part also. It's available Perfect. for free from Starburst. So you don't need to worry about like yep. necessarily ordering online. Of course, I'd be more than happy if you do, but yeah, um, go grab the free PDF at least to see if it's worth it. And yeah, it's free is. PDF. If you like the actual book, you will have to pay, which, you know, I, I think I'm actually going to at some point because I just, I've read through the PDF a couple of times and I just, every time I have to reference, it's a great reference book as well. So I occasionally pull it open to reference it. I just, I need a real book. So I think I'm actually going to buy it one of these days <laughs> so that I could actually have, and, you know, because I just want to see the that cool frog uh, sitting up there. So shall we go on to the PR of the week, Manfred? Let's do it. Sure. Okay, so this week's PR of the week actually came from the previous uh, release, 363. Yeah, it's new. Yeah, it's very new. I, I thought, you know, we needed, so we I, I kept the same question of the week on the original show that we did this. Uh, so we'll, we'll cover that here in a sec. But um, I wanted to make sure we covered a more re recent uh, PR. And this was actually given to us by some of the folks from Bloomberg. Uh, Bloomberg, I, I, we, I feel like we have not given them enough love on this show yet, but they do a huge amount, uh, in the, in our Trino community. They, they contribute a whole bunch of stuff back. Uh, I, I know that they were slightly involved, if not 
so the lighters of the Cumulo. Cumulo connector. That's yeah. exactly yeah. So they made a whole Cumulo connector, and they've done a lot of incremental stuff. A uh, uh, big hi and shout out to Eric Anderson. Uh, I don't know if he's watching this one because he he's like ah, I already know everything I need to know about Trino. But, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, anyways, huge shout out to him and and his team. I mean, they they do a lot of great work uh, in the Trino community, including uh, this. Uh, they. Um, they, I'll, I'll go over like their kind of, uh, you know, overview of the goal for this, but the basic idea is they wanted to be able to do more fine grained, uh, system logging, uh, when it comes to the queries. And we get questions about this all the time. I'm like, how do I know when this query and how long it took, uh, things that different things that happen. And so in general, you have to write your own, uh, and we'll go here into the, uh, developer well, guide actually, here. Let's step back one sec. So if sure. you want to know that. You can't see it in the web UI, but yeah. the web UI just shows the last whatever, like a little bit. And then yeah. when it's older, that's, that information is gone. And what Trino does, it has a system called event listener um, that you can implement. Um, basically, it emits events that say, oh, that query finished now, and this is all the data about it. Um, and that's what uh, you can hook into to get that information captured elsewhere, right? Like currently the web UI obviously uses some of that info and displays it, but yep. you can have an event listener implemented and that's what these guys did. And and what they did specifically was they wanted to make it uh, an interface or a, basically a, a, the event being sent using HTTP so that any system that's trying to absorb that or, or you know grab those events can just do so by just getting this JSON blob and parse it and do whatever it needs to do with it to store it or or you know maybe alert somebody hey something you know we're we had this query that's taking forever you know do something now and so um so that's ultimately uh yeah, you know the, the goal of this. right like you could pump it in like i mean literally you could have Prometheus. a server that gets yeah. those events or or some streaming system that gets the events yeah. and then pumps into the database and then you can query it again with Trino. Yep. And you could also put it into things like these visualization systems. I know a lot of people use like Prometheus or, or Grafana for like, you know, uh, alerting them when like, you know, they have like their big dashboards that they build out and that, that shows their whole systems, you know, running. And yeah. then, the, and then you, you know, you basically say, if this happens, show red on the thing, you know, because <laughs> we, we do not want this to be taking so long or, you know, or at least kind of start showing, Hey, you know, on this day, around this time, we started getting these warm queries. Uh, let's save all the information, all the logs for that. And and then, you know, you could actually customize it so that you can go and investigate those logs long after. Let's say, you know, it's like on a Friday afternoon and you're like, well, I don't want to look at that until Monday. So, you know, you just, you come back around on the next Monday, you go in and look in the logs and see what's going on, why the queries slow down. And then you talk to us on Slack, you know, <laughs> and so, um, so I, I do uh, wanted to you know uh, say this. This was to um, M. I think it's the last name is Osai. So M. Osayek, thank you so much uh, for uh, for contributing this. Uh, always wonderful getting these uh, these contributions from Bloomberg. Um, with that, shall we move on to the question of the week and finish off this episode? I was like, uh oh, should I uh, wait for Manfred? And I think he actually had to drop uh, just due to the top of the hour. So I will finish the question of the week. Uh, the question is, does the Hive connector depend on the Hive runtime? And this is the question that I asked on the first, uh, the first episode. And I wanted to bring it up again because it is such a common question. I even wrote a blog about it that is linked in the show notes as well. So if you, oh, <laughs> I did not link it correctly. But if you look into Trino blog or the Trino blog here, and you go to the archives and you search for Hive, and gentle introduction to the Hive connector. So, um, so this will basically uh, co cover a lot of, you know, basically be the answer to this question. But what I wanted to basically point out is uh, the, the short answer is does Hive connect? The, does the Hive connector depend on the Hive runtime? And the answer is no. You the Hive the Hive connector is called the Hive connector because we're talking about how Hive actually you know models the data that it gets stored in there. So if you look at what Hive looks like in an architecture uh, setup, I like to split these into three spots. So you have Hive runtime, which is 
you know, I'm, I'm lumping in the Hive clients here, but you, the Hive runtime is really these Hive services, the CLI, the Hive server, the web interface, the driver, the file system, the execution engine, all this stuff that would basically take in the Hive SQL statements and map it into a MapReduce thing that runs on top of your, your Hadoop system. And so that was a really slow, clunky thing that basically Trino was created to, to replace. And so when we look at what Trino looked like whenever that was this was created, this was the runtime that replaced it. Now, oh, and I didn't actually mention that the three, I, so I talked about the runtime. We have a meta store over here and we have the file storage here. If we look at the Trino architecture, you, when we use the Hive coordinator, or uh, sorry, the Hive connector, um, we, uh, we basically are replacing this runtime here with the Trino cluster. And so this is that query engine part we were talking about. We still use this Hive Metastore. This is one artifact that kind of sticks around, but it's not the entire runtime. It's not actually how we execute the query. This is how we find out about more information about what files are sitting here in file storage, how they're laid out, what columns they have, uh, what are the maybe some indexes that we could take advantage of for some file stats to basically you know help us with uh, or or partitions that you know help us not scan all of the data uh, every single org file or parquet file that's sitting in there or JSON file as uh, as our uh, friend just commented uh, and so you know any file that you have sitting in file storage there's data sitting in this Hive Metastore that tells you about how that data is laid out, the uh, kind of files in there, and how to parse it apart, the serializer, the deserializer to use, all, all this information is stored in the Hive Metastore. But when you actually run the query itself, when you're actually doing all that streaming and the planning stuff that Mar uh, Manfred and I were talking about before, that's all happening on the Trino runtime. So that's the kind of too long, didn't read uh, answer to that question. And so, no, we don't use that when we use Hive. Hive uh, and we, and in particular, um, you know, when we're looking at just this this concept of a let's say a data lake in general, this is you know a data lake is when you're storing this these files here in S3 or HDFS or something like that, and you need to you know have this kind of metadata model set somewhere. Right now, it's it's pretty much always in Hive Metastore, and this could be in the same for when you move over to Iceberg. We we still use Hive Metastore for a couple of that metadata, even though some of that metadata is now. Uh, moved from the Hive Metastore into the file storage itself when it comes to Iceberg. But very similar use cases when we talk about the Iceberg connector, it's doing the same thing. We, we Iceberg is, uh, you know, the, the table format itself is all, you know, sitting in file storage, sitting in the Metastore. And the actual thing that's running it is is Trino. It's, it's not, you know, using some external system to uh, like like you would for MySQL, where it's actually a, another database that's stood up somewhere and running. No, this is actually, um, you know, files sitting somewhere on on a on a object store or on a HDFS system, and then you know a meta store somewhere that holds the the metadata about that. And so, for lack of a better term, so uh, if you want to like kind of dive in a little bit more, uh, I will have the this blog, or you could even look at this blog. Uh, it's live right now, uh, and just look up the gentle introduction to the Hive connector. You can even Google it. I'm sure that'll probably be one of the first things that show up, and uh, and then. You can, uh, you know, dive a little more into the, you know, kind of uh, in intricacies of, of, uh, you know, me explaining this a little more if it's not totally making sense yet. Um, last little thing I want to quickly mention is uh, we did have an overview from one of the Trino maintainers. Uh, uh, I'm, I don't know if his, his name is actually pronounced Carol or Car Carl, but uh, um, it's uh, basically Carol is. Uh, he uh, talks about uh, the basically how that cost based optimizer part works. And he actually covers it in a, in a really cool le level of depth. So if you, uh, you know, he, he starts out talking a lot more higher level Trino stuff and then gets a lot more into the weeds about cost based optimizer. So definitely check this one out. Uh, he, he, this was at the CMU database group uh, for in Cambridge. Uh, so it's really uh, kind of cool opportunities. And we're trying to, reach out more to schools and get uh, more involved in talking about Trino at schools. So um, so with that, uh, I would say that will pretty much uh, end our um, our broadcast for the day. Um, let us know if you have any questions. Uh, do join uh, the Slack channel um, as usual. Uh, let me see. And, and th those links will be in the uh, bottom. Also, you know, do give us a star on uh, github.com forward slash Trino DB forward slash Trino. Also, uh, follow us at TrinoDB. Um, thank you very much for everybody for attending today, and uh, look forward to seeing you in the next one. Oh, one last little uh, administrative note. 
we are looking to move these uh, these two these Trino community broadcasts from biweekly uh, or every two weeks to moving them out to once every month. And the reason why we're doing this is I want to start basically putting together a lot more enablement content of basically, you know, actually put together courses versus, you know, kind of what I've been doing with Trino Community Broadcast. We do a little bit of training in the show, but it's not very formal. And I want to actually have like a very formal uh, kind of course progression. And so to put the time into this, uh, you know, we're hiring uh, somebody else. Uh, so if you're interested in being a developer advocate, uh, advocate um, if you wanted to be a developer advocate and do what I do, kind of like, you know, help educate people on cool stuff like Trino and databases and stuff, uh, definitely uh, reach out to me on Slack. Uh, be interested to hear from you. Um, and then if you, uh, so, so we're hiring for a spot for that, but in the meantime, uh, you know, I'm going to be planning out some courses and doing a lot of stuff around, you know, help enabling people, uh, you know, basically answer a lot of the questions that they have and getting them up and running on, on Trino. So, uh, so that's coming down the road. Uh, but in order to do that, I need to maybe do a little less of this Trino community broadcast. So for uh, a spell, we're going to be moving to every month. So basically, you know, 12 episodes a year. Uh, we'll probably do it at a very specific time since we're not doing it by the week. And so, uh, so you know, just wanting to give everybody a heads up on that and uh, still look forward to continuing to produce these wonderful, exciting shows and having a lot of you on to talk about, uh, you know, how you're using Trino and, uh, you know, specific concepts about uh, around Trino. But in particular, yeah, just, uh, you know, note that that's going to be coming down the line. So great. I will see you all in, in this time. We'll be seeing you in two weeks. So talk to you all in two weeks. Thank you very much. Music for the show is from the Mega Man 6 gameplay album by Shishtof Swabikowski. Don't forget to give us a star on the Trino repository at github.com forward slash TrinoDB forward slash Trino. And for more information on future shows and to find show notes, check out trino.io forward slash broadcast.